always room for new experiences. I've never uh, given a homily in the ring. Well, like this, I guess. But uh, it is what it is. <clears throat> the, the readings today, uh, the first reading sets the stage for us understanding the Beatitudes because it talks about the wisdom of God and how, I mean, to sometimes to us human beings, God's wisdom seems to be foolish initially. It seems to like not make sense at first. And Jesus, this is the backbone of his teaching, and I know Steve will go into a lot of it later on. But the, the Sermon on the Mount is his, what do you call it, like his greatest work, his magnum opus or something like that. You know? So it's, it's the core of his teaching, but what he does is he, he flips the standards of what one would consider blessed on their head. And so he asks us to be open. In a sense, to, to appreciate the Sermon on the Mount takes a lot of humility on our part. Humility meaning like acknowledging that, look, we don't know it all about God or even about how to live the most fruitful or successful life. The nature of a blind spot is that you don't know it's there, right? And we all have them. And so it's letting God address like the blind spots in our life. So I just want to talk about two Beatitudes, because you could go deep on any number of them, but what, the first one is one that's always troubled me as a man, and that's, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So I think when we think of meekness, we think oftentimes of weakness, like meekness equals weakness, and who wants to be weak? Who wants to be spineless or subservient or things like that? I don't think any of us want to be that. And especially, I mean, I know women don't want to be that, but especially as a man, that's the last thing we want to be is a weakling. So what does Jesus mean by me? We look through the scripture. The scripture talks about Moses as being the meekest man on the face of the earth. But well, here's an example from the Bible. In the book of Numbers, uh, Miriam and Aaron speak out against Moses. Now, God had been appearing to Moses directly, and they criticize him. They say, well, shouldn't the people be listening to us? God's also appeared to us. And Moses doesn't do anything. In that, it's in the book of Numbers, like chapter 14. Moses doesn't do anything there. He doesn't retaliate. And in that passage, it says that Moses was the meekest of men. So some, there is some sense that, that meekness is not retaliating. Or not retaliating at not being provoked. You know there's a difference between reacting and acting. And a lot of times we're provoked and we react. So meekness has something to do with a restraint of anger and a self-control. Another example of it is Jesus. The Pharisees are confronting him, looking to to kill him. And I think it's like Matthew chapter, I didn't write it down, it's like Matthew chapter 12. And he chooses to withdraw and not confront them that day. Okay, now to go to the background of the word. And again, all I do, basically, I read books, and then I'm just repeating to you what I read, okay? Reading scripture, <laughs> commentators who understand the Hebrew and the Greek, and communicating that to you. <clears throat> so apparently, in the, the, the context of the word, uh, the Greek and the Hebrew, we, we could look back to the philosopher Aristotle. This, this is what he said meekness was. It was sort of virtue. And for Aristotle, virtue is in the middle. It's not extremes. So in terms of anger, meekness was not, not excessive anger. You know, all of us have probably been exceedingly angry at times. So we just blow a gasket. That's definitely not meekness. But nor is it meekness is being excessively passive. It's anger at the appropriate moment. So anger is not, it's, you know, as an emotion, not a bad thing. 
In fact, it's an energy that can create needed change. But Aristotle says meekness is somehow this balanced anger that's in the center. It's reacting appropriately, a measured response at the right time. Also, that, that meekness is, is this. And so if we could wanted to refashion this beatitude, blessed is the man or the woman who has every instinct, every impulse, every passion under control. So you see the tie into self-control. We know, look, it's impossible to be completely self-controlled. But and here's where it ties in to, to God. It's impossible for us, and we're, we're told to cultivate the virtue of self-control, but it's not possible to be completely self-controlled, but we can place ourselves under the control of God. And we can say, Lord, you help me to react appropriately. And so meekness is this self-control that's blessed by being God-controlled. Because the grace of God, well, we don't... I'm convinced we don't know most of the time when the Holy Spirit is acting in our lives. There are some times when we know it, but God's doing a lot behind the scenes in us. So in this, this cultivating this virtue of meekness, it's placing our lives under God's control. And that's, that's a degree, again, of humility. The, the Jesuits really like the, the, the Jesuits in terms of their, their spiritual heritage that they passed on to the church. There's this thing called the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, and it involves push-ups, sit-ups, and a lot of prayer. Calisthenics <laughs> and prayer. And it involves going through the Gospels and trying to get into the, the mind of Christ and letting Christ address you out of the Gospels. But the, the backbone of the, the spiritual exercises is the realization that you're a creature and that I'm a creature and that God is the creator. And as a creature, we have limits. So, this, this, this virtue of meekness this, this, that Jesus is trying to teach us is a virtue that's sort of in the middle. To not respond, but rather to let God somehow grace or even vindicate you. You know what that means, to be vindicated? It's sometimes when your sister pokes you in the eye and you say, all right, I'm not gonna slug you in the face right now. <laughs> Rather, I will wait. I will, I, will go. I will wait until I can run you over with the car. No, that's not that either. It's rather, I will wait. And you know, God will sort you out. You're gonna get yours. Huh? You'll get yours, but I'm not going to kick you down the stairs. Huh? Okay. Anyway. <laughs> I don't want to get off on a tangent. Well, as a, I was, I'm the middle child of two brothers. My oldest brother was brilliant when it came to, this is a little tangent, but it's funny. He was brilliant when it came to retaliation. And my younger brother would sweat all the time, so he would rap. He would have us wrap him in blankets, and then we would pound on him, and then he would flip out and get all sweaty, you know, and that was the psychological. <laughs> but Jesus didn't teach that. See, Jesus taught the self-control anger at the appropriate time. The next one I want to go through is, is mercy, okay? So that's, that's meekness. It's deeper. <coughs> Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be, be shown mercy. We know that we all want to be mercifully treated at times, and that's being treated better than we deserve. But again, in the Hebrew word, it's translated from the Greek originally spoken in Aramaic. The Hebrew word implies something. You've heard the, the figure of speech, walk a mile in someone else's moccasin, right? Mm -hmm. To put yourself in someone else's shoes. The, the idea in the Hebrew is that... <clears throat> You're merciful, you treat someone seemingly better than they deserve to be treated because you've had such a sympathy towards them. You've tried to place yourself even inside of their skin. You've tried to be understanding. You've tried to see their situation and where they're coming from and identify with it so completely that you are exceedingly merciful. We know that people behave certain ways there are reasons for it 
The, re the reasons don't have to be good reasons, but there are reasons for why people act the way they do. To be merciful is to try to understand and identify with, and then treat someone accordingly. <clears throat> Ultimately, Jesus Christ is the most merciful. He comes. We can't, we can't never say to God, you don't know, you can't, you didn't go through what I'm going through. The whole point, not the whole point, the part of the point of the incarnation is God's identifying with us. So he takes on flesh. He works hard, like Steve was saying. He suffers. He suffers loss. His friends abandon him. Okay? He understands what that feels like and what a person might do out of that space. When you feel, you know, in... In counseling, they say, hurt people, hurt people. You ever heard that? And so, so mercy is, in a sense, trying to treat people better than they deserve because that's how God treats us. But from the standpoint of identifying with them in the closest possible way that we can is by trying to get inside of their skin. And then we'll be shown mercy. And we know the law of the gospel is, Jesus says to us, you have to forgive. You won't be forgiven. It's a very difficult teaching. But when we enter into this, this mercy, then, then this peace is possible. And it starts by trying to identify with people. So there is, you know, there's just, if you study this Sermon on the Mount, it's really fascinating. One of the things I love about Steve, I've watched his videos. He used to teach Bible class to high school kids. And we watch it. I love his enthusiasm. I mean, the guy's just like fired up, right? Well, I think the fired up is, part of it is, is a good thing for all of us to think about because there is so much here. I just <coughs> talked about two Beatitudes. Just two. There's so much depth. There's so much meat. None of us know at all here about the Sermon on the Mount. So I really want to encourage you to dig in to some of these, the, the works of some of these scholars because it really is fascinating. It adds a depth to our faith. I will stop. <laughs> the Lord's peace. So we're, we're trying to be meek, merciful, and all the others. <laughs>